Ireland. It's Bob Glazier. If I make it, my next birthday, I'll be 89 years old. I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, and people call me and I answer the name of Bob because Mr. Glazier was my father. I graduated Emmerich Manual High School in Indianapolis in uh, 1942, in, uh, I guess it was in June. And uh, when you hit 18 years old, you have to register for the draft. And I went in August and registered and enrolled at IU in September with a great unfilled ambition of being an attorney, which was my ambition in life. I finished the first semester, got my draft notice, and I went to see the dean, and I said, I think I'm going to not go to the second semester because I have to re report for duty on March the 4th, 1943. He said, if you stay one week before you have to report for duty, I'll give you full credit for the year. I said, that sounds good to me because he knew my ambition, et cetera. Uh, I went to school and uh, the second semester, English was the subject was difficult for me because mostly it was composition. And I had never been any place except visiting a relative in Detroit and that was about it. So I wrote compositions that got great grades of D and F, and I didn't know any better. So I finished that. I had accounting, which I got an A in, and uh, I, I don't remember the other courses. It's been over 70 years ago. And I f went to school and then reported for duty. I was drafted, went to Port Benjamin Harrison, and stayed there about three nights that was assigned to my basic training, which was at Camp Walters near Fort Worth, Texas. It was desert training with water discipline and a bunch of hillbillies from the regular army. And, and every Saturday night, they'd get drunk and come into the barracks about four o'clock, say, we're gonna have a short arm inspection. Who knew what a short arm inspection? Well, we found out, and if you don't know, and if I tell it, it may not be appropriate for all ages. So I'll stop there. The, the desert was the training was desert training and I had extensive training on a automatic Browning water cooled machine gun. Learned to use a mortar to, to use the azimuth and all that stuff and uh, finally left there, came home, had a week's vacation in I think it was July of nineteen forty three. Might be wrong and I uh, reported to Camp Shenango, Pennsylvania, and stayed there for a few weeks to get reassigned to another camp in New York City, near New York City, and I don't even remember the name of it. And I had a, a night's leave in Times Square, New York City, and had a, the CDs were first coming out. Pepsi Cola had a storeroom, and, and they would do a free CD to mail it to your parents, and I did that and uh, I know what happened to it, but I will not go into that. The next thing I knew, I was assigned to go overseas. They didn't tell you where. Going up the, dang the gangplank, there was a sergeant with two colored charts. One was red, one was black. The guy that got on before me got a red one. I got a black one. And I said, what are these for? He says, well, the red ones are gonna be uh, below deck in the, in the bunk, they were four high for 24 hours. They were allowed up on deck to get three, two meals a day, breakfast and dinner. Time you went through the line, washed the mess kit, you had enough time to go down and digest your food and go back up and stand in line again. That went on for about 13 or 14 days. Landed in Tunis, Tunisia. Was assigned to a repo depot on Black Mountain with pyramidal tents, six people to a tent. And we were there for a while, and I had an ingrown toenail that was really infected. And we fell out for inspection to go to where, I don't know. And I couldn't put my boot on because it was all swollen and pus and so forth. And the colonel came by, he saw my shoe was on my field pack. He says, what's that for? I said, I've got an infected foot. Okay, you fall out and go to the medics. And I went and I stayed there another 10 days. When I went, I went to Benghazi, Libya, 
out of 40 and 8. That was a World War I boxcar. 40 men and 8 horses with the soldiers, with the field packs. I think there were 27 or 28. And we'd stop every so often and get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or else some sea rations, which was a can. And they warned us the Arabs will come to the, to the boxcar and try to sell you fruit. We urge you and warn you, don't buy the fruit because you'll get diarrhea and don't drink the water. Well, that lasted for four days. We got to Benghazi, went into camp, and uh, we loaded the next day on an LCI, which was a landing craft infantry with our field packs. And uh, it was tight there, and I had the great pleasure of being assigned to KP. So I used to open those cans and put them in the big pots and heat them up so we could serve them in the mess kit. And uh, after we got out to the Mediterranean, the fumes of those uh, rations got to me, and I had to head to the, uh, I'll call it the head of the bathroom. And there were two toilets, one looking this way and one facing it. So if you two people got on them, your legs and knees almost touched together. But I was fortunate nobody got in the second toilet because I was doing my business in one and puking in the other. And I went back and finished my KP. We landed at Salerno, waited ashore. It was waist high. And from Salerno, they put us in trucks and they took us to Naples. Naples, we went to a place called Bagnoli di Ripoli. It was a racetrack and we pitched our pup tents there and we were there a few days, and I don't remember much of the details, except I did get, we did get leave for one day to go into Naples, and I remember reading, riding the funicula and went up on the uh, main, on the streets, and I was with a friend of mine, and his ideas and morals were different than mine, and he went his way, and I went mine, and it was time to go back, so we reported back, and the next day we were reassigned to Caserta, and I don't remember too much about it, but I do know we took mountain training there, carried the machine guns up the mountains. And then from there, after a few weeks training, we were assigned to our division, which was the 34th Infantry Division, Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota National Guardsmen. And uh, they had their units, they went overseas in 1940. This was 1942, I think. and. Uh, uh, they were trained and they were finally assigned to go into Salerno after it was captured and they went up to Caserta and we joined the uh, 168th Infantry M Company 1st Battalion, no the 4th Battalion, that was a machine gun squad. And uh, we took our training in the mountain training and finally got assigned to our division which was there and we went into combat. Now the first combat that I remember after all the training was the night of November the 4th, I crossed with this platoon the Volturno River, waist high in water, four different times. And uh, every time we'd cross, we'd hit land and go across again. And I might tell you that uh, I didn't have kidney trouble, but I acted like I did. I, should, I want, should I tell it? You, I peed every time we stopped. So we went up the mountain and the, we went up quite a ways and the, there was a farmhouse that we were behind, had a, a stone wall around it and we heard a, a vehicle coming down the mountain road which faced the farmhouse. And the, the commander said, everybody hit the ground and don't make any noise. So we hit the ground and before the truck quietly got there, my sergeant opened the gate, it was a booby trap, mine, killed him on the spot. The guy behind him, he got hit pretty bad. I don't know what happened to him. And I had shrapnel. I had concussion in my leg with a ball bearing in it. And I got a piece of shrapnel in my chin, which I deadened my whole side of my face. And I put my hand up like this. Couldn't feel anything but the blood running down. And I thought, oh my God, I've lost my face. So they put me on a stretcher and they carried me down the mountain to the road. They put me on a Jeep, they put the windshield down, and there was one room for one Jeep, a corpsman and took another corpsman, and the driver, and we went to an evac hospital, and I remember this, and I would not swear to it, 
But as we were unloaded and went into the, the paramal tent, they had a guy looking at the wounds. He said, take him to the right, he goes to the left. I think the guys for the right were really wounded badly and went to surgery, and they sent me to an, the other way, and I laid there for a couple of days, and I was evacuated down to Naples. Went to the dock on Naples, waiting evacuation to Africa, and the thing I remember most about that was I looked out over the bay and I saw Mount Vesuvi erupting with smoke and fire going out like mad. It was terrible. Then a nurse came by. We were laying in a cot on the, the dock, and she says, hey, soldier, you feel all right? I says, yeah. She says, where are you from? I said, Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, we've got a doctor from Indianapolis. I said, oh, you have? What's his name? And she told me, Dr. Irvin Kaplan, who happened to be a second cousin to me. He came over, I had him examine me, I, and his uh, nickname was Itzy. I said, Itzy, I want you to do me a great favor. I want you to write a V-mail to my mother and tell her what you see and I'm going to be all right. And he did that for me. She got it in two days. And then I, uh, from there, we jo joined a company and we went up to uh, Monte Cassino, which was the gateway to Rome. And the average person on the street that's over 40 years old never heard of it. It was an abbey that the British bombed by night and the Americans by day until they leveled it for about two months. And the German paratroopers occupied it. And we were going up the mountain against them. So my life was saved by that wound. And I was evacuated back to Ferryville, North Africa, into this hospital. And uh, I had a fever for a week or 10 days, and they could not figure out what happened. And finally, they looked on my back, and I had shrapnel in my back, and they put me on a fluoroscope. Fl and they fluoroscoped me, and they found this big hunk of shrapnel that took over a month to heal. And I didn't have any, any pain after they took it out. I had an ache, but I don't know what it did, whether it touched my lungs, whatever the alcohol was, except that it took a lot of time. And from there, they made Salerno, and uh, they needed troops, because the, the uh, casualties were high, and also they were getting ready for the invasion of Normandy, not that month or that year, but they needed replacements. So they emptied out all the colleges. That's why I was drafted, Then a lot of guys that I went to school with, some of them were signed. I met a few guys from basic training that they went a different way, and I went there and knew nothing. And I didn't want to make friends because I happened to know that the company that I was in had a high casualty rate because of the machine guns, because the mortars used to knock them out. So we were assigned to a drainage ditch, which we called the Mussolini Canal. It was sh 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 shaped like this, but there was no water in the bottom. And I was assigned to a machine gun nest on the corner of this uh, ditch with another guy. And uh, the, we listened to the Germans having mess, you could hear them talking. And I fired a few rounds, and all of a sudden the rifle fire was hitting the embankment, and I went down, and I never fired it again because we were never attacked. And from there, we went on. Uh, well. Uh, Rome fell, the partisans were battling the fascists, and they tried to clean out Rome, and that's when the American troops went in. And uh, the first thing we did when we took Rome, we went to the Vatican in the Piazza Vaticano, and there were 100,000 other people there, and they gave us leave. So we went in on liberty. And uh, from there it was really, really exciting. And then we went back to our company and followed up through Northern Rome. We went, uh, to, I belonged to the gas section then, and uh, we uh, kept up with the tanks bringing gas. It was on a six by six. It held 220 five pound cans. They weighed about 80 pounds. In those days, my age was 19, and I could lift 160 pounds, 80 in one hand, and swing them up on the truck. And when we went to unload them, I stand on the edge of the truck with a can in my hand and hit it on the road and then stacked them from the truck. And that went on all the way through northern uh, Italy, Modena, Padua, 
uh, I just, it's been so long ago, I don't remember all the, the names. And uh, we ended up, uh, at the end of the war, we were at the airport at the Modena, and uh, there was a bar in the hangar, and I, we had free time, and I went to the bar to get a beer. I'm really grown up then, I'm like uh, 20 years old. So, so I had my beer and they had the radio on in the bar and the radio blared out, La Guerra in Italia è finito. The war in Italy is over with. And that was in um, May, but I never got home until November. The war was over and the time, all the red tape and the different places we went, uh, I got home. and. Uh, it's on a ship, we stopped at the harbor in Tunis. There was a storm. The ship had no ballast in it. The waves were coming this way, and the ship was going up and down and sideways at the same time. You know what? That's an invitation to be seasick. And uh, when I came home, uh, the, the train, I picked it up at Port uh, Patrick Henry, I think that's in Virginia. We loaded on trains. And the train stopped at Union and McCarty Street in Indianapolis. And I looked out the window and I saw the house as I grew up in. And uh, that was really exciting. And went to Camp Atterbury. Discharged, took a day and a half, turned in what equipment they wanted to. And uh, I came home with a barracks bag on a Greyhound bus at Union and McCarty Street. There was a synagogue. My first cousin was getting married. I stopped there, and my folks were there, my family, and I attracted a lot of attention for a while. And then when the uh, wedding was over, I came home, of course. In those days, we were affluent. I lived at 2811 North Delaware, and it was a big shack with four bedrooms and a staircase, probably built around the 1900s. So at any rate, we were happy there. And uh, I went to Ma Emanuel High School. I graduated there. And uh, my first my first job after I got home, I was uh, they call it post traumatic stress. I got home in November, and if I hear a noise, I would jump. I remember the next day I got out of the service in uniform. I was at Meridian Washington Street in front of the Forsham Shoe Store. A car backfired, and I was near the the end of the sidewalk. There was a newspaper stand that incidentally my father owned, and I was in the gutter until I got my senses and I got up, go to the movie, people bought popcorn for a nickel bag in the paper bags, they'd blow them up and pop them. I hear them pop, they didn't go bop, bop, bop. Once in a while, I'd hear it and I'd get shocked and jump and ended up under the seat. And my mother brought me out of that. So I think the first job I got was in February. I was a bartender and a bouncer in a place none of you people ever heard of. It's called Steins, it's 11th and Meridian. And I got tired of that because I was making very little money and breaking up fights. So a friend of mine had a storm window business and I went to work for him as a canvasser, Al Mordo. And we're still friends, he's 93 years old. And uh, we've been knowing each other since I've been five years old and have been friends. Sometimes real nice, sometimes a little rocky. But we're still friends, our family are friends. and. Uh, it comes back to a couple other businesses. I, I, uh, when I wasn't canvassing, I went over, he had a car lot at uh, Park and uh, New York Street. And I go there, he had cars he'd pay 300 bucks for, sell them for six. He'd sell five to 10 of them on a Saturday. And I said, where the hell have I been? So my younger brother, Sam, who was my partner since 1948, we, he scraped, he didn't have, I didn't have any money. He worked at Ayers, he had money, he had a car. And uh, we scraped up enough money to pay a, a month's rent to Charlie Stewart, he had an Oldsmobile franchise. And we started in the business there with two cars and we ended up buying the property years later, maybe 25, 30 years later, and sold our accounts receivable and went into the loan business. From there we were in the real estate business. And that's my life, I had three kids, I think you know, and you know you're sitting here, there's Lynn, an attorney, Steve, an attorney and manager of his firm, and one of the owners, and Richie, who's a successful pianist that lives in California, 
with his wife Jan, who is my daughter now, not my daughter-in-law. She's the one of the family. And uh, I can say that about Dave and for Steve. So, and uh, that's about my story. I've got my grandchildren, and uh, the biggest loss of my life was my wife, 31 months ago, and we still live in the same house, as you all know, and here I am. And I'll say this to you a million times, and I've said it before, the only reason I'm still here is because of my family, because that's what I got to live for, and nothing else counts with me. And I wish you all good luck, happy lives, stay healthy, the main thing. I'm through.